بسم الله الحمد لله والسلام على رسول الله الحمد لله we have a wonderful opportunity uh, to gain some beneficial knowledge from a very wonderful speaker today from California today we have tonight we have Dr. Imad Bayoun uh, from Riverside California uh, Dr. Imad Bayoun born and raised in Beirut Lebanon and he uh, got his uh, PhD studies in entomology. Currently, he's a uh, he's uh, employed at the University of Riverside, uh, University of California Riverside, and he's completing his uh, his PhD studies in, in Islamic studies. Alhamdulillah, he's a wonderful asset to the community in the sense that he provides very good and beneficial beneficial lectures, including topics of purification of the heart, which inshallah today we'll be able to benefit from. He's uh, currently a professor or instructor at Oak Tree Institute. He is a mass member of, actually, a, uh, an active member for mass in Southern California, the Greater California area, and help help the community quite a bit. So, inshallah, today, I hope, tonight, I hope you guys get an opportunity to benefit from this reminder and how we can implement it into our lives. So, inshallah, I'll give it to Dr. Inat Ayun uh, for the meeting. So this is something actually in the essence of our religion and the, uh, the value and the acceptance and the value of the deeds reflect the value of the heart. So the greatness of the deeds reflect the greatness of the heart. As the Prophet that in the, in the body there's a piece or an organ, if it goes sound, the whole body goes sound. If it goes corrupt, the whole body goes corrupt, and that indeed is the heart. And there's a beautiful statement made by Imam uh, Hassan al Banda. He said that the deed of the heart is more important than the deed of the senses, even though perfection is required in both. Which means we are required to have perfection in both, but what differentiates a certain act from another in a person versus another, is the difference in the heart. That's why two people can be praying exactly the same way. One person will get nothing out of it except fulfilling the obligation. And the other person will get so much out of it that the difference is only in the heart. That's why Basri, husband of Basri said, referred to Abu Bakr Sadiq. You know, the Prophet praised Abu Bakr so much. Is this too much echo? Is this okay? Praising Abu Bakr, the Prophet praised Abu Bakr Sadiq about that so much. And here, Hassan al-Basri was talking about the greatness of Abu Bakr. And he said, مَا صَلَاتُكُمْ أَبُو بَكْرِ بِصَلَاتِهِ وَلَا بِسْلِيَانِ وَلَكِنْ بِشَيْءٍ مُقْرَى فِي قَلْبِ The difference between us and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is in the heart. We pray the same way. We pray the same way the Prophet did alayhi salatu wasalam. But the whole difference is in the heart. And you can say the same thing about all the great people in the history of Islam. That they differ in that which is in the heart, which eventually reflects itself on the actions. You know, like Sayyid Qutub, he said that if a person has something good in his heart, he cannot tolerate to keep it in his heart as a steroid 
value or survive belief. But eventually, that thing which is in the heart has to find its way out, has to be expressed. If the person truly has something of value in his heart, that thing has to find its way to be expressed. So it always actually starts with the heart. And it is the heart actually that is exposed to temptations more than anything else. Like the hadith of Hudayfa, sorry, Hudayfa bin Yaman radiallahu anhu, when he said, Tu'arabul fatum ala al-kulub ta'adha hasibu udan udan aw awdan awdan, that the temptations are exposed to the hearts one piece at a time. And he said, any heart that gives in, it will start a dark spot on the heart. And it keeps on getting bigger and then eventually it engulfs the whole heart. At which time the person will not be able to tell the truth from the falsehood. So it all starts actually in the heart. And the hearts get sick, like the mouth do. You know, they categorize actually the sicknesses of the heart into two main categories. One of them is the uh, what's called the shubuhat and shahawat. The doubts and the confusions, that's one category where the person starts doubting about God, about different things, or confusion about the reality of things. And the second part is, the second category of sicknesses are those that are related to uh, desire. Can you take the point of down just a little bit? The second category having to do with actually the, uh, the desires and the temptations. And this is another category actually of, of sicknesses. You know, so it starts actually in there. Everything starts in there. And the difference is, is reflected in the action which starts actually from, from the heart. For that reason, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala judges the heart, or judges based on the heart. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, On the day of judgment, or nothing else, except the one who comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a sound heart. And also in hadith of Rasul alayhi salatu wa salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not look at your shapes, but he looks at your hearts and your deeds. He doesn't look at your shapes because he's the one that gave you that shape. So you don't have any credit in that regard. Allah says in Ali Imran, subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, It is he who fashions you from the wombs of your mothers, however he wishes. So he's the one that chooses for you to have this skin color, this height, this thing. So Allah cannot judge you on that, which you have no credit in. But when it comes to the heart, we all start from the same point. Everybody starts from the same point, which is that of the filter. We're born with a heart, but then after that, it is our effort that leads it in one direction or, or the other. Now when you're talking about, of course, this tesbiya, or the purification of the heart, let me ask you first, what do you understand from this tesbiya, or purification of the heart? What do you understand from that? I mean, what's, what's that to you? That was a question. <coughs> There's no brain in God. What do you understand when you hear the Tazkiyah? The Tazkiyah is important, you know. That's what we're talking about, right? What is it? What are we talking about? The purity of the heart. What is that? Yes? Um, maybe it's the, the attempt to continuously purge, uh, cleanse the heart from the sin that you commit. Um, exactly. From the attachment to this world that prevent us from getting closer and closer to God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to that original state of um, fitrah, the original state. Zakat al Actually, this is part of it. This is half of it. Uh, it's a good description that we try to purge the bad out of our heart until we go back to the fitrah. You know, purging or cleansing the heart is part of it. But the second part is the enrichment. You know, you have to get rid of something and you have to gain something. You know, that's why this enrichment is part of the tazkiyah. When you have this spirituality, the life of the heart. You know, how come a person would pray and it becomes something mechanical, but somebody else would pray and he's in a different world altogether. He has something. And so how the problem is, you know, once actually the Prophet I saw sent into the masjid, and a person started praying like the uh, kicking of the rooster, cannot dig, going up and up. Some brothers do that. And you know how they can read the Fatiha? And suddenly they go down to the Quran immediately. How do they have the time to read that? So the Prophet saw somebody doing that quickly, you know, drive through. And the Prophet told him, Something Fatiha, come to somebody, repeat the prayer, we did not pray. 
And the man repeated the Gizgat and he said, <laughs> so the Prophet told him, repeat it, you did not pray. And the man repeated it again. And he told, Ya Rasulullah, that's the way I know how to pray. And the Prophet explained to him, sometimes what happens, we're used to doing things in a certain way, we don't know what we're missing. And that's a problem. We think, that's it. I mean, is there more into the prayer than this? Is there more into the religion than this? But the problem, we don't know what we're missing because we don't know actually what's in the religion. And a lot of the time, we don't pay attention to matters of the heart. We pay attention to the uh, shame. Again, this is something that we have quite to take care of, but it's not, it's not the spirit of the worship. I mean, go, I can tell you, every time I go to a uh, Ramadan preparation workshop, what are the questions about? What are most of the questions regarding? If I do this, will it only find my fasting? If I do that, will it only find my fasting? Is it okay to do this? But what about the spirit of fasting? What about the spirituality of fasting? So much of the time we don't pay attention to that. So that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about the spirituality of the heart, the life, the very life actually of the heart. And then there are some specifics to it, you know, but this is really in general what the Tazkiyah uh, is about. If I were to ask you, what do you think is, according to you, the best way to achieve this task? Just sit and wait. <laughs> I think Dua, right? Of course, Dua is essential, but it's Dua is only one part of the test. Uh, maybe starting with the right intentions. Starting with the right intention. That's good. That's good. But the question actually is transferred there. How would you actually work on that intention? Yes. Zikr. What? Zikr of See, the zikr, all of this is a zikr. All of this is a zikr. But what we're trying, what we're talking about is the life of that zikr. And not just the mechanics of it. By the way, what you said is correct. Just try to make it argue the other one. Anything else? Yes. Yeah. To mean it, to mean what you do. To mean what you do. Yes. Yeah. To be there, to be present. What do you do? Yeah, for your heart to be present. Yeah, Again, faith makes go through the actions. Yes, yes. How would you do that? You know, first, I think it's really important for us to believe that this is possible. You know, sometimes when we go through a certain state of the heart, what we feel like, I don't want to say our heart is dead, but our heart is not too living. <laughs> There's something missing in there. And we feel that, you know, I wish I could have that, and we think that this is it, there's no way out of that. It is really important to believe that there is a way out. I mean, change is possible. A change is always possible. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plays the heart, the sound heart, and the Prophet said, that's what you'll be judged on, it means it can be attained, it can be changed, right? I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not say that this is the best thing to have, and would make it impossible for you to have. That's why a proof that a change in that direction is possible is the command that actually is there. So the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to obtain this purity or enrichment, it means it can be done. Allah will not ask for the impossible, right? That's a proof. So a change is possible. Another proof is that sometimes you go through moments that you feel that. You know, sometimes you go through certain moments where you feel really close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whether during a prayer, or during a certain act, or tafakkur, or Qur'an, or whatever, you go through these moments, which means that they're possible. They are possible. They're not impossible. You can do that. Another thing is that if it's possible, if it's great, if it's important, what is the way to attain it, right? And here we don't have to, uh, how should I say, try to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to try to start from zero. The path is already described to us. The path has proven itself. The path was coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who created is the one who legislated. The one who created is the one that showed us the way. That's why this is the most efficient way. There's no other, there's no other way that would achieve it the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Prophet alayhi salam was described. First, like I said, because he created. The second thing, you see the reflection of that in the Sahaba alayhi wa ta'ala. And anyone that followed their path. You know, the Sahaba and the Prophet himself. Everybody started from the same point. Again, we start from the Fatah. But look at the quick change and the drastic change that they were able to achieve within a short period of time. 
I'm not just talking about the spread of Islam and the success of the da'wah. Of course, that's given. But I'm talking about the heart specifically. How would Umar ibn Khattab change from being the toughest person into being strict still, but having the gentlest heart when it comes to connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What changed? How could he change like that? How could the Sahaba change so quickly? We're not talking about changing which is superficial, which sometimes you know we pay attention to. Anyway, you know, uh, I used to be called uh, whatever, my, uh, my name is Muhammad, or I used to do this, now just something super. This is good, I'm not saying, dismissing that. But what I'm saying is that we have to look deeper. The change has to reach deeper than that. And that's what the Sahaba did, I didn't point that. The Sahaba were able to change drastically like nobody else. And not just the Sahaba, anyone that followed their path. Even today, you find, mashallah, some brothers and sisters that Iman shines on their heart and they become different people altogether. And the change is not just superficial. The change is deep. So that's what the Sahaba went through. And here, by the way, an important thing to keep in mind, you know, a lot of times when we describe the Sahaba, I even want we describe them almost as being ideal or perfect or infallible. They were not. The only infallible was the Prophet The Sahaba, they had the shortcomings. And this is not to diminish their greatness, by the way, but that's how they went. The Sahaba had their weaknesses, had their temptations, like everybody else. Sometimes when we describe them as being too, uh, too perfect, we get the impression that they, uh, they're irrelevant. But they were not. They argue with one another. Sometimes even in the presence of the Prophet. Then comes the beginning of Surah Al-Hujurat. Do not raise your voice above that of the Prophet. So they had some of these things. That's why it's really important when we're talking about the Sahaba or some of the uh, some of the early righteous people you know, to talk about the, uh, that which is authentic. Yeah, and you hear sometimes that this Tabi'i or Sahabi, for example, used to read the whole Quran and teach like that. When is that even possible? You can't do it. You cannot. It's not doable. I mean, if you were to read the whole Quran quickly, even ignoring the Akam of Tashweed, it's going to take you a whole day to read the whole Quran. But sometimes we have exaggerations like that, that makes it impossible to follow their example. But the Sahaba, they went through the struggle. They went through the struggle in that quest for purity of the heart. But the important thing here, and here, what he said, when he was talking about why the Sahaba, how, how could they be that great? He said they were always attentive and watching their own behavior after they become Muslim. They were always watching closely what they were doing. And if they ever slipped back into their old ways and their old habits, the Jahiliya way, which happened sometimes, they would immediately correct the situation. That's a very important point. You know, when do we uh, slip and get further and further? When you feel really safe and secure. MashaAllah, I'm so good. Not gonna get any better. And you find yourself doing the walk. But when the person actually watches his behavior, then he's less likely to stay. And the Sahaba I mean, would let have that part. Which takes us to something really important whenever you're talking about a change or the Tazkiyah specifically, is that it's a process. It is not something that you attain and you don't worry about it anymore. Allah will wish it was there. But it's something that you have to struggle with continuously. And that's the way it is with all the deeds of the heart. Whenever you deal with any deed of the heart, the struggle is continuous. A person, take one who mentioned the ikhlas, for example, the sincerity. Well, that's one of the biggest things that we struggle with. You know, you start with that sincerity or you may reach a certain level. Yes, I'm doing it for the sake of Allah, and Allah is my only goal, but it doesn't stay like that. It changes. And that's the way it's a continuous struggle, the way it is actually with all the other deeds of the heart. Whether it's a deed of zuhud, whether it's asceticism, or the deed of thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or a deed of sabr, the struggle is continuous. So there's a difference between knowing about it and then having it. You know, Ibn Qayyim, alayhi wa rahmatullah, when he described in a great book called Madarij al salikin he was describing different deeds of the heart. One of them is tawakkul. That's one of the elements of enrichment of the heart is the tawakkul, the counting on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he describes it so beautifully. And he said, beware. 
Understanding what tawakkul means, it doesn't mean you have it. When you understand what tawakkul is, it doesn't mean that you have it. It means you understand what it means. But then after that comes the striving and the struggle to acquire it. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described it so beautifully in Surah Al Ankabut, where Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا Those that practice jihad for our sake, we will guide them to the truth. But the interesting thing is that that verse was a Mecca verse, which means it was revealed before the fighting was legislated. So this jihad that the verse is talking about is the jihad of the self. When you resist a temptation, when you resist a tendency, that would lead to Iman. That's why guidance can only be the fruit of a struggle. It doesn't happen in any other way. You know, sometimes we can play, you know, one exercise, I do whenever I visit with some of the MSAs, what would be the one thing that would change your life drastically, tremendously for the better? And I can tell you probably 85 to 90 percent of the answer is a stronger a stronger belief. It does change someone's life drastically. But that event doesn't happen by wishing to happen. That event happens, a strong event, the deskia, happens by taking the path for that event to happen. It doesn't happen by wishing. Yet imagine a person, myself, I'm not talking about anybody else. If I feel like looking at haram, I look at haram. If I, do like, if I feel like doing something haram, I do it. Inshallah, I don't do it. That's just an example. Or if I feel like saying something bad, I say it. If I feel like looking or giving in to certain tendencies, I do. And then after that, how come my iman is not that strong? Well, because I'm not going through the path, I'm not taking the path that brings that iman. So iman can only come as a result of a struggle. Without that, it will not happen. A change, a sustainable change, can only come as a result of a struggle. It's a process. It is not just wishing for it to happen, and it happens. We don't believe in this. You, you wish for something, then suddenly the light shines up from above, you know, and then, you know, I'm changing every person. We don't believe in that. It doesn't happen this way. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, This is the path. This, you know, hidayah, guidance can only come as a fruit of the struggle. Without the struggle, it will not happen. So if you want the strong iman, this is the way. There's no other way. There is no other way. Except by resisting. Doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's one of the reasons Iman or fasting, I'm sorry, fasting reflects positively on somebody's heart. Because you're resisting something, winning for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you'll find it actually, you find the gain immediately actually of the heart. This is in general about the desk. Of course, the desk has some specific elements to it. Any comment or question? Change, of course, the greatest element of change is the closeness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything else, everything else branches out of that is to have a strong connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what is the strong connection? What is the way to achieve that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How would you strengthen that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Discipline. What? Discipline. Discipline. Well, this is, the whole thing requires discipline. The whole thing requires discipline. But definitely, when you discipline yourself for the sake of Allah, this definitely strengthens your bond with Him. One of the greatest elements that brings about this tazkiyah is the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, Ibn Qayyim again quoting him again. He said that if ibadah, the act of worship, is like a bird, is likened to a bird, then one way would be hope, the other wing would be fear, and the head of the bird would be, would be what? The love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, a bird will not fly without one of its wings. You have to have both in order to have a balanced worship. Too much hope, too much hope, the person will take Allah for a breath and will stop sitting left and right. Too much fear would paralyze you. So you have to have a balance of both. So the bird cannot fly without both, but the bird would die without the head, which is the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And some of the scholars, they said that our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter is based on love. There's no fear. Inshallah, we ask Allah to give, it, to give us a journey, all of us. There's no fear. It's the love that remains. So this love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the spirit of our emotion. But the question is, how do you learn to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No, no. Why do you You have to know him. You know, how would you love? I mean, of course, there's this tendency, this fitra. By nature, people love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's easier to love the Prophet alayhi the same thing. But how would you love someone if you don't know them? That's why the more you learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more you know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has at least, at least 99 names. Allah has many more, many more names. But there's one hadith that by Abu Hurairah in Bukhari where he said, Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, in the Allah, this atam wa tis'im asma, bi'a in the wahid wa ahsaha da khadr jannah. And there's a version in the Tirmidhi that lists the 99 names. And some believe this is the Savior actually of Abu Hurairah himself, the list itself. Some believe that is from the Prophet. Now, here, when the Prophet said, Man ahsaha da khadr jannah, anyone who's ahsa, I'll explain that, encompasses these 99 names, will enter in jannah. What do you have to do to get this quality, to enter in jannah with these 99 names? What does that mean? What does it mean? What takes you? What should you do with these 99 names to enter the channel? Too many questions? I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, I'll do that with you. Act upon them. Act upon them. First, you have to know them, right? You have to know what these names are. And these, by the way, are not the only names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Hayyid al Rasul alayhi salam, his dua, Prophet, used to say, Allah may be expert, okay, put this in the Muslim, who are like, Sammaid al Ibn Nafsak, or as that of Fiki Tabik, or I left out of Ahadam. That Ya Allah asks you by every name that you have. So, but these 99 names have a special value of So to know what these 99 names are, to, to know that Allah has certain names, I mean if you can memorize them, it's great. Yes, we memorize so many things. So many poetry and graphs and everything, you know. That's why we can put effort to memorize these 99 names. There's nothing wrong with Allah. So to memorize them. The second thing to understand their meanings. You know, these names have meanings. The names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reflect his attributes. You know, our names may not reflect our attributes. So you may have a person whose name is Kareem, for example, generous, but he may be a wise man. So the name does not always reflect, that's for us. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his names reflect his attributes, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So understand, to understand what these names mean, right? That's how it is. The third is to sing those names. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of his names is a razzaq, the sustainer. Okay, the sustainer, the one who provides not just wealth, by the way, money, but also knowledge as part of the rest. The, the bond among us is the rest. The Prophet alayhi salatu was saying, describing Khadija, he said, inni ruziqtu hubba, that her love was a rizq to me. So anything coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a result. Now the question is, do I see that Allah is a result? Again, it starts by understanding the meaning of that name. But then after that, I have to contemplate and to see that name. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a rahim a rahman a rahim Do I see that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a ghafoor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a hadith, the all patient subhanahu wa ta'ala. He doesn't send his punishment swiftly. If he does, none of us would be alive, by the way. That's what Allah says in the Quran. Allah says if he were to punish all the whole people, the cattle for the deeds right away, then he would just like Allah he would not leave anybody alive. Looking back at your life, do you see that Allah is Halim with you? Was Allah Halim with me? Yes, he was. One of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a Sitir or a Sattar or a Satir, different versions by the way. The one who conceals. Who can see my own shortcomings? Because I have plenty of them. Who does not? You know? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not expose me. Do I see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a sitir? Is it something that I see? Or is it just a name that I understand what it means? That's why it starts with that. A great act of worship, a great ibadah, is the ibadah of tafakkur, the ibadah of contemplation. 
And you find that in the Quran in many places. This has to resolve itself. It is not just a statement like that. Allah says, you may think, you may ponder, because that's what brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you don't know Him, how would you love Him? That's why it starts by knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the more you learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the closer you get to Him. The closer you get to Him. You know, I can tell you that yeah, Allah is one person. And if you trust me, yes, yes. He said, Allah is merciful, Allah is merciful. But much stronger than that is when you see it yourself. And the whole world is around you to testify to that. The ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are all over the world. Allah says, Sumrihin ayatina fil athaqin wa fi anfusihin hatta yadabayyad lahu anahu haq. We will show them our signs, our ayat, in themselves, and the whole world, in themselves, yourself. Allah says in another place, you know, uh, uh, فَلْيَنْظُرِ الْإِنسَانُ إِلَىٰ طَعَامِهِ 